Now, I have the pleasure to introduce the world's best CEO, Lars Rebjen Sørensen from Novo Nordisk. He has been atop the company for the last 15 years. He's taken it to a position where it's the biggest one in Denmark by value. But I think, first and foremost, he will talk about that it's a global company. To be in that position takes leadership. I'm sure you're all excited right now. You want to hear what he has to say. I know he has a, uh, let's say, a critical mind. For instance, when it comes to being named the world's best CEO, he just told me a moment ago he thinks stuff like that is rubbish. <laughs> so Lars, please take it away. to the 40,000 people that are no Nordisk. I just happen to have had the luck of leading the company in a very unique period of time with unprecedented growth, unprecedented value creation. And I'm sure my successor who will be named in a not too distant future will be even more capable than I am. But I think he will find it difficult to create the same type of growth because the environment for business, the environment for our business have changed. So don't put too much into these rankings. Uh, it depends in the businesses you're in, in the cycle of the business that you're in, and if you have luck and work hard, then you can also become the world's best CEO. First of all, I have to agree with the, the rector uh, that it is an impressive crowd here, and uh, I've, I'm a little bit uh, reflecting back on my own time when I was studying you look very self-assured, you look very determined, you look like you know uh, where you're going, what kind of uh, career you want for yourself. But if there are some of you that have a little bit of anxiety, a little bit insecure about what you'll eventually end up doing, let me give you just two minutes uh, my background. Just as to illustrate to you that you can't figure it out ahead of time. I'm a master of science in forestry. That's a strange education. Uh, my father was an engineer, and I have run the risk of offending all present engineers by saying I went to the, the Danish uh, Polytechnic uh, Institute in Lyngby. I stayed there for three months, and I was extremely bored by the technical drawings, and I felt, felt, found them quite complicated and not very interesting. So I dropped that, went back to school and educated children, until I decided, what should I do with my life? Become a pilot? That would be fun for a young man. But then I realized this is a, like a sophisticated bus driver going from A to B and B to A, and it'd probably get tedious after a while. Doctor, a lot of uh, members of my family are either nurses or doctors, and, but, but then I, already at that time, I had worked in a hospital for some years as a janitor, cleaning floors and serving food for the patients. And I had seen how doctors are behaving uh, towards the staff, the patients, uh, let alone the janitors. Uh, the janitors don't even exist. So I was not very impressed with the environment uh, in the hospital, and therefore I said, maybe not, maybe not uh, becoming a medical doctor. And at that time, the environment was coming to the forefront of being interesting, limits for growth, and all the stories we, we can remember. So I decided to become a forester, a very elite education at the time, almost entirely for boys, because it was hard work. It was sort of like uh, Navy SEALs for environmentalists. And uh, I finished the education. Now I fly all over the world, all the time. I fly even more than a pilot and I work with medicine. Now, who could have figured that out? I certainly could not plan it. So if you have a little bit of anxiety, the only advice I'll give you is finish your studies, finish them fast, as well as possible, and then magic can happen. Now, let me go on to the, uh, the, the purpose of my being here, is talking about Novo Nordisk. Um, 
many of you are familiar with uh, with our company because you probably have read uh, a little bit about it in the newspapers. We were formed almost uh, 100 years ago. Uh, we are a global pharmaceutical company uh, today. Uh, we are located all over the world with a headquarter in Denmark, uh, with our home markets being Europe, but we have an increasing uh, share of the American markets you see in uh, North America. International operations are all the emerging markets around the world where we have more than 50% of the market. In China, we have 56% of the market, and in Japan, Korea, we have 49%. We are global leader in the fields that we have chosen to compete in. And one uh, conclusion already here, we have decided only to focus on what we're good at. I have been part of the leadership for many, many years, and I have been responsible for some of the most spectacular value loss or destruction in the company by trying to focus on something which we did not really understand. We got excited about a new opportunity, but what we didn't realize was it was not playing to our advantages, it was not playing to our skills. So as they used to say in the Danish bank, only focus on that what you're good at. In the global competitive environment, that's the only thing you can hope to succeed with. And especially if you're in a business where there's expanding demand for products that are coming out of your competencies. And that is why, when you're in industries that need to diversify because of lack of growth, it becomes much, 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 much more difficult. And that is why we have been lucky that we are born in a company and work in a company in a field that is exploding. It's sad to say, diabetes, more and more people get diabetes. So there's unlimited demand for our product for the only thing that we're good at. So we're not forced to diversify. 41,000 people listed on NASDAQ, 88 billion. I don't think I will, I will surprise people by saying I think we will surpass uh, 100 billion very, very shortly. Uh, listed on New York Stock Exchange as the first Scandinavian company. Uh, and because of our foundation and our articles of association, we are committed to long-term value growth. And that means that we take social and environmental issues into consideration when we run our business. And here's back to the competencies. It has taken us 15 years to figure out what we are good at. This is what I think we are good at. So whenever we try to make investment decisions, we make it based on whether or not those skills can be applied and make us leaders in a particular area. So far, it is applied in the area of diabetes. It's applied in the area of obesity, which is a risk factor for developing diabetes. So beating obesity is in a way preventing diabetes. So it makes sense to us. We are focusing on biological pharmaceuticals uh, that are applied in obesity. Hemophilia, that is when you lo lack genetically some clotting factors and you become a hemophiliac. We give them clotting factors and they can survive and live normal lives. Growth disorders, that's when you, you lack growth hormone, then you're a little person. We give them growth hormone, then they can become a higher person. So fundamentally, <laughs> fundamentally we, and diabetics, they lack insulin, so we give them insulin. It's very simple. We replace hormones or biological factors that are depleted from individuals. So this is, this is our credo. Some of you that study business has probably studied the Johnson & Johnson credo. All companies need to identify what's our ambition, what should we represent to our potential employees, to our current employees, to our customers, and to our shareholders. If you can cook it down to one page, there is a chance that even the CEO might remember it. It takes an awful long time because every word in this means something special to people at Novo Nordisk. Through this formulation, we have identified where we are heading, what our ambition level is, and how we're going to go about doing it. So, our ambition is to strengthen our leadership in diabetes. It's not highly surprising. But in the previous one that was made 15 years ago, it said to achieve leadership. So there's a subtle difference. It's it's much more difficult now. We, we are, we've come moved from being the Danish football national team to become the German national team. It's diff different. It's a different ball playing uh, you play when you are you are leaders and you have to retain your leadership. Now, if we if we look at diabetes uh, as the biggest areas that we have, 
I said there's unlimited need for our products in the future. You can see the number of people with diabetes here is estimated to grow to 600 million in 2035. I'll show you in a minute that only today only less than 10% of people with diabetes are either diagnosed, get care, and get care that's appropriate such that they get a decent outcome of their treatment. Only, s only less than 10%. So there is unlimited growth potential for Novo Nordisk. Which is why it's a stupid idea to diversify. You have to focus on continuing to be the leader in this field. And that's also what is easiest for you to do. Diabetes, we don't need to go into the etiology of diabetes. 95% um, of people with diabetes are having diabetes because of lifestyle and environmental factors. They are overweight, not enough exercise. It's usually social determinants, uh, ill education, ill uh, life, work life, income, uh, that leads people to make health choices about their life which are uh, not very smart. They run the risk of developing diabetes. Then there's type 1 diabetes, childhood diabetes, which is a, a different type of diabetes, which is caused by s some external factors combined with the genetic factors. Just look at the cost. Global diabetes healthcare cost in 2013 was 550 billion US dollars, of which medicine accounts for less than 10%. And we know that with better medicine, we can reduce the, the healthcare cost. Deaths to diabetes in 2013, 5 million people, the total Danish population. This is more than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB combined. And it has got much less attention than those three diseases that I mentioned. Not because I'm trying to belittle those problems, but we have something here we can deal with and we can improve if we just go about doing it in an intelligent way. Here is what we call the rule of halves, which is quite scary in the sense that only half the people that have diabetes have been diagnosed. And of that half, only half have access uh, to care. And of those half, it's only half that receive appropriate care. And of those half, it's only half that receives a decent outcome of their th therapy, bringing us down below 10% in terms of outcomes of living with diabetes. This leads to huge productivity loss on behalf uh, of the global population. Our ambition is to grow the number of patients we treat. We treat today approximately 24 million people every day for their, uh, re their requirements of life-saving medication, without which they will die. It is hugely motivating to save people's lives every day you go to work. Which is also why I say it is easier to create an exciting culture in a company when you, when you save lives, as opposed to if you were making mattresses or whatever I can dream up. Mattresses can be exciting also for various reasons, but it is much more difficult to lead a company and creating an exciting story about mattresses than it is of saving people's lives. Now, innovation, I was talked. I was asked to talk a little bit about innovation as well, because it is called leadership and innovation. So I thought we stick one slide in there about innovation or two. Uh, so we cover that part of the agenda as well. Now, there is an interesting story here. This is, of course, uh, starts with the uh, identification of the hormone called insulin, which is responsible for, or lack of insulin is responsible for people getting diabetes. And then we start working on that. We refine the, uh, the insulin uh, production and make it cleaner and cleaner. But one of the interesting things here, since I am in, in, in Jutland, uh, is that our company would never have existed without Danish agriculture. Never, ever. We started extracting insulin from pigs and from cows. The pancreases from the slaughterhouses was collected, extracted uh, the insulin from that, purified it, and gave it to people with diabetes. The people that were, uh, that were manufacturing our products in the beginning were people from the dairy industry, because they understood a little bit of hygiene. And since these were pharmaceutical products, that was important. Then later on, with the discovery of the hum human genome in the 50s, it was later uh, identified that you could use part of the human genome is machines for manufacturing human therapeutics. The first human therapeutics to be manufactured in microorganisms was actually insulin. The second was human growth hormone. 
So that means we could stop collecting pancreases from the slaughterhouses. We could stop cutting the head of dead people and take the pituitary gland out and extract growth hormone from it. We could produce insulin and growth hormone in infinite quantities based on yeast or coli or whatever uh, modern biotechnology methods we use. And we just kept working on it. Now we have made human insulin. In the beginning it was of course animal insulin. Now uh, we are making human insulin. Now we are making analogs of human insulin and we are just improving them, improving them and improving them. We also define what products we are in. We are in biologics. And for those of you that understand a little bit uh, about biology and chemistry, biologics are proteins or hormones. And that's the only thing we're good at. Whenever we try to make small molecules, synthetic medication, we make a mess. We destruct value. We don't understand how they work. And we end up not being able to be in leadership positions. R&D, we have 4,500 employees in the world. We have 90 PhD postdoc science students from Europe, uh, United States, and Asia working in our labs. And uh, we also have very leading uh, diabetes and obesity researchers uh, that are funding innovative research taking place both in the United States and Canada. We invest 12 billion, which is uh, why, and a lot of it is invested in Denmark. This is why we are preoccupied about uh, public funding for research. It's creating an eco system in Denmark where we can attract ideas and c competences from. We have a huge patent estate in a very narrow area and uh, our score on bioethics, bioethics, this is this topic of treating the animals uh, that we use for testing but also treating the patients in an appropriate way so that we don't violate patient integrity and patient rights. The development process process for developing a new drug is tedious and long-term. Only one out of 10,000 ideas become a drug. And it takes 20 years, normally. That's another reason why this ranking stuff is nonsense, because what I am reaping is the research initiatives that was taken in the 90s and even before I even started working for the pharmaceutical part of our company. So you can, s and what I'm doing today will be something which my uh, successor will benefit from many years into the future. So it's a very, very long timeline. So I think you can see that it's, it's kind of iffy. Now, there's a Im very important point here. Are you in business to make money? Is that the main focus? We are a privately owned company, and I would say the business of business is business, but in a long time horizon. And when you extend the time horizon from a quarterly earnings to annual to five year, then social issues and environmental issues become financial issues, and therefore there is no real contradiction between talking about corporate social responsibility. It is simply a notion of maximizing the value of the enterprise in a long time horizon. Michael Porter calls it shared value, and he's trying to, to bring that uh, forward as a concept in the U.S., but he's finding it increasingly difficult. Because in the U.S., as you all know, short-term earnings uh, are the most important thing. So to the financial end of things, this is the evolution, 12% uh, average on the last 10 years. I can say if we go back to the beginning of the company, it's basically been 12% on average. Uh, we are faring slightly less at the moment, and the numbers are also getting very big, so it's getting difficult to grow double digit uh, when you t have a turnover of 100 billion. Where does it come from? The majority come from America, very little from Europe. Europe doesn't want to pay for innovation. Danish patients get old medicine, and uh, the same applies uh, in some emerging markets, but there are in emerging markets we also have a very affluent group of the population that can afford insurance. Uh, you see 14% growth in our business there, region China, 13% of Japan, minus 1% an aging population, cost containment, financial uh, problems in Japan leading to a flat market for our products in Japan. We are represented all over the world with manufacturing, uh, you can see here we have manufacturing in Japan, in, in China, in Russia, 
in France, in Denmark, in New Hampshire, in Clayton, and Montes Claros in Brazil. A global footprint where we are capable of manufacturing the same products everywhere. One standard, global processes, one quality. One of the things that can destroy our company is if we screw up with quality. If we kill some of our patients, then we're dead. Not only the patient, but we're dead as a company. So we need to instill, even though we want productivity, we need to instill a high sense of quality. We also need to understand the business ethics. I found myself some years ago on the front page of Berlingske, together with Saddam Hussein. This was not exactly what I had planned. <laughs> Our company has, not based on leadership decision, but based on local entrepreneurship of our colleagues in the Middle East, engaged in trading under the Oil for Food program, and consequently we were prosecuted and we went into a settlement with the US Department of Justice and were hung out to dry for wrongdoing on the business ethic. We u I use that as an example uh, to my colleagues to say, I don't want to see a picture like this again. If we get even close to that and we find out, you'll get fired immediately. This sounds easy, but anyone here that knows how Danish business has operated uh, in many, many years, that Denmark was the last company to ratify uh, the tax reforms uh, whereby third party fees uh, could no longer be tax deductible unless you were ensured that they were not used for bribes. We'll know that this is something that takes time to change. Business culture, ev many places else, are different uh, than the one uh, that we define in Denmark. And then finally, we try to set the employees free in the company. We are very regulated. We are the most bureaucratic company probably in Denmark. Maybe compared to the financial sector. Because we are regulated by the health authorities, we are inspected left, right, and center every year. But what we, we employ extremely gifted people, and we want th to set their creativity loose. So we basically tell them, you should be honest, you should be ambitious, you should be accountable, and then we want you to make the choices. And when you make choice, you should always have in your mind what is good for the customer, the patients what's good for society and what's good for our company long term. Then you can feel proud about what you're doing and you will not mi misrepresent uh, the company. I think I'll stop here because uh, I would like to invite as many questions from the audience as possible because I can speak a long time uh, about this and that's not the intention. I think we will get more of it out through the questions uh, and the answers perhaps than me speaking here. So uh, Paul Egg, will you join me? Yes. Certainly. Thank you. And I'm, um, <laughs> I couldn't help thinking yet there's a certain satisfaction, I guess, for you that Saddam Hussein is gone and you're still yeah, here. That's what I usually say. I, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have, we have questions coming up already. And uh, let me go for number two here. Your leadership capabilities, are they specific for Novo Nordisk or do you believe you could have had the same success leading a different company? And it says, and why? Which means they expect you to say yes. I have been working for the company for almost 34 years. Um, I have sort of, it's almost become like a symbiosis. My own personal values and the values of the company uh, have become one and the same. I think leadership is extremely contextual. By that I mean it depends. It depends on the business, it depends on the ownership of the company, it depends on the risk willingness of the owners of the company. So our leadership style and the way we go about doing it is perhaps only relevant in no noise. But what I think is maybe generally applicable, I told you I met Caspar Holten uh, just yesterday at another event uh, where he was speaking after me, and I was extremely excited to hear him, him talk about how does one manage uh, the opera. Uh, because opera is the most value destructive thing you can think of. It's very costly and adds no value whatsoever. And he ended up, 
he ended up, s and it's the most expensive thing to set up, right? It's both music and dance and everything uh, in one, and singing, of course. Uh, and so he ended up saying he's found that his role was to create an engaging story about the play that they were going to perform, and also the role of the theater that he's now managing. It's exactly the same that I do. Create an exciting ambition that's stretching enough, but also achievable, and make this complex world that we live in simple enough for people in the company to understand it. You make it sound so easy. I mean, you're leading a global company. Even if you are telling a compelling story, even is, if this is about helping people and not yeah. mattresses, you are, you, are in, you are all over the world, you're in different cultures where you have to tell the same story, but it may be understood differently in China than it is in Denmark. That's correct. Interesting thing is you have to find a balance. When I enter into one of our offices in the 87 countries where we have representations, it's like coming home. The visuals are the same, uh, but the way our values are expressed are, of course, different. The work culture in Sweden is different than the work culture in Korea. In Korea, they take the shoes off. They also do that in Sweden when you come home to people, but that's another matter. Uh, <laughs> but they go, they go in the countryside in their country home. They work much less hours uh, than they do in Korea. So, so what, what I try to tell them is, how do you articulate honesty in Korea? That's what you should aim at, such that our company is perceived in a Korean context as being the most honest and open and modern company in Korea. And we know, of course, that's business culture in Korea is slightly, slightly different uh, than it is in Europe. So you, you tell yeah, them it can to be done. Th think for themselves? Yes. Come on, yes. I, c I, mean, I can't do it for them. Mm. I'm not Korean. That's why we employ Koreans and Japanese and locals everywhere we are, but we try. And the thing is, <coughs> The, the values that, are, that we are ascribing to are sort of more humanistic, uh, generic, Scandinavian, if I'm really going at it, Danish values. Uh, but they are globally applicable. They're talking about a world, a society, which has an appropriate balance between the individual and community. We call it social democracy or whatever you want to call it. And as we, if we look at the world, China is moving from being and, and Russia is moving from being communism. It's all about the community, which leads to the leadership looking after themselves and the masses not getting anything, into a more similar world like ours. America, exactly the same. Coming from brutal capitalism to regulated capitalism, something which looks similar to us. So I think we it resonates to people everywhere, those general values. So a world starting look looking more like what we do here, in a way. In the world needs more of what we are like, uh, I would say. Now, I, I, I sense when I see what's atop here that, that people are thinking, hey, there's, there's a job opening there in a few years. <laughs> so if you were to hire your own successor, what, what questions would you ask the candidate in that final interview? Well, I, th you, I don't think I'm disclosing anything uh, secret by this, this process of identifying uh, a CEO successor is one of the most important processes for a board of directors. This is not something you just sit down, okay, let's throw up a coin and see what, what we have. It's a very, very structured process where you try to identify the departure point in what does the future look like for the company? What are the challenges that we're standing in front? And then you identify what competences should the, the next CEO then have to be able to meet these challenges. Then they start to look, what do we have? What team do we have? How ca do, can they fulfill that now? If they can't, how can we develop them in some way so that we can see whether they have the skills required? And then you measure it. So it's, I think we have a very structured process. I think we have the capabilities internally in the company for at the time, uh, speaking uh, now. Do you uh, have a role in that? Um, yeah, what? Do you have a role in, in this? Yeah. yeah, I do. Because Obviously, the board, I have to be the interlocutor between the board and the management. I know uh, what the management team represents, and I can translate that to the board. But then I ask them to valid validate my perceptions with some in external 
tools, 360 degrees, consultants evaluation, mentors, whatever, because I'm biased. I've worked with these guys for 10, 15 years. I could have my you know, candidates uh, plus and minus. Uh, so I try to be sort of... But how do you avoid then that they're all sort of, if I may, you know, take a parallel here, American politics, that they're all running a primary, in a primary every day where you get, you know, the final vote? Well, because you don't want that, do you? No, but some of them disqualify themselves by doing that. Right. Then we'll have a conversation, because that's not very productive for the company and for themselves either. Because if we don't deliver results now, next quarter, next quarter, next quarter, then none of them will become the CEO. Now, I'm not always going by what's the top here, but uh, what's the largest mistake you've, you've made as a leader? You said you'd, you were responsible for losing yeah, lots <laughs> a lot of, of dough. Lots of money. Well, on a more personal level, I think the, the biggest disappointments that I've had is when, when we, I've had to influence people's lives in a negative way, firing some of my, my co-workers that I've worked with for many, many years. That's a it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Also, when we have to close activities uh, that, that I have perhaps uh, started as a good idea, then it turns out it's not such a good idea, and then 400 people lose their jobs. Those are the main, I can, I can point to one uh, that I know for fact was my mistake, and that was trying to, in spite of good advice, to uh, see if we could administrate insulin by inhalation. The reason why we went down that route was that others were trying the same. So you could say, I can at least hide myself by the fact that it was sort of an insurance that the competition should not take it over, but it was a bad idea. And it turned out to be a very bad idea, and we spent a billion dollars on it. So that was, and, and 400 people lost their jobs. And, and what's your leadership role there? Because, I mean... But well, then you go yeah, and you fire the 400 people. Yeah, but then you tell them this nice story about Novo Nordisk. They don't want to listen to that then, No, right? but I, I tell you one thing. This was a company we had in California and I said, this is very bad. We're gonna, I'm going to have to go over and then f fire the 400 people. And I was, I was having a very bad day, obviously. And, and they could really tell that I was not feeling very comfortable. And so it was actually the other way around. They came up to me <laughs> afterwards and, oh, we're going to be okay. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's California. We find, we find other jobs and, and we're used to this here. T take it easy, I mean. So it was a, a kind of an interesting experience. So they, ob <laughs> ob they obviously hadn't learned the Scandinavian way there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right, there's, there's another question. Um, let's go into that, the top one. Students are, students are increasingly starting their careers in advisory. Consultancies. Consultancies. Yeah. What, what, what's your, cha uh, your choice on this? I mean, I, I've been the, with the same company for 27 years. You said 34, so maybe, I don't know whether the two of us here are the best to answer stuff like that, but what, what, what's your take? My son is currently working as a student help in McKinsey. Uh, I didn't advise him against it, I have to say. Right. Uh, I think that can be very good in terms of getting a perspective on, if you don't really know what you want to do, you get a perspective of different industries, uh, you learn different tools that are useful in business. Uh, unless you know exactly what you want to do. If you want to become a medical doctor, you don't start in McKinsey. I mean, then I would s suggest that you start maybe working in a hospital on the side, uh, something which is relevant for what you want to do. Uh, so I, I think it's, for business, I think it's great uh, with consultancies. I, I noted a, a word, uh, not that you used it, but I wrote it down for myself when you talked about your own story, because it was, it, I, I heard it the way that you're actually telling people to remember to keep a bit of doubt in their mind mm -hmm. before they choose. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, all the others don't know what they're going to do either. They p just pretend they know. <laughs> I mean, I, I've always been coming across as being very self-assured, but I mean... You're a great pretender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what I wanted to do, but I'm the minority then. <laughs> now, um, how are you going to approach the, the challenge of increased focus from governments on prices in the medical sector? And uh, there's, a, there's a debate going on oh in, in the US right now. It, it's part of the presidential campaign. Hillary Cl Clinton, who might very well be become the next president, has been out saying, we need to regulate you guys. Yeah, I, this is one of the, uh, the biggest challenges we have at the moment. If we look at our sector, the innovation is paid for by Americans. 
and reach people in developing countries and people in Switzerland and Sweden because they are the ones that are willing to adopt and pay for new uh, medication in a much more structured and rational way than we say either in Denmark or in Germany. It's completely weird. Uh, and, 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 and unless we can convince the politicians to also co-fund innovation, then we will get no new drugs. And that's actually much, much worse. So we have to build a system where somebody is, is willing and able to pay for the innovation with the aim that this innovation will become generic and be mass produced for the big majority populations. We are the biggest generic manufacturer of human insulin in the world, meaning we can deliver insulin for the cost of a cup of coffee anywhere in the world. Brazil, 50 euro cost uh, insulin for a day. That's not prohibitive. Uh, but we also have uh, some very expensive variations of it that are slightly better and when and if you can afford new medication, then of course you want the best. So this is the model that we use and, and that should be used globally. But you're up against, you were, you were talking about telling a story to the people working at Novo Nordisk. Yeah. You need to tell this story, I guess, to people in general. The story about yes, yes. innovation, the story about doing yeah. good. I mean, you're yeah. up against, for instance, a guy who buys up a, a company with producing generic drugs and then raising the prices, what was it, 1,600% or something like that? He's, he's not very well seen in the industry, I have to say. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, in a free economy like the US, you can do that. But what I can tell you, that would be generic copies of exactly his drug very, very quickly. And so that's uh, one way to kill him off or what? Yeah. We will find out how to make sure that he won't be able to build a sustainable business on that. <laughs> I'll, follow, I'll follow that story. <laughs> now, y you talked about, I'll, I'll go outside the questions here a little bit, because you talked about just finding out what you're good at. And you made it sound easy, even though you said it was a long process. It was a long process. But what if you're, to take a parallel, what if you're, you found out 20 years ago you're very good at making fax machines. So you stay with your core business of fax machines or Kodak. What do you do then? What, what if it turns out there is another way of getting insulin? That actually somebody tomorrow comes out, out with some, you know, you inhale it. Yeah. Technological obsolescence. I mean, there are many examples where, where technology has moved, and it's not, it is not always the incumbent industry leader that comes up with the, the new and breakthrough technology. The trouble, and, and where, where people sometimes forget, is that to make that breakthrough innovation, you have to run 100,000 experiments. So if you're leading in one field, you cannot run 100,000 experiments of finding out how you make your own business obsolete. It's because there are so many other companies around the world that w are working to try to make you obsolete. I think Nokia actually had a touchscreen phone. Nokia does identify their cores as making the best handsets in the world. And all of us that have smartphones, today, and Nokia is no longer existing, know that smartphones are lousy phones. But they are offering a different experience. And therefore, it made the handsets. I mean, you probably had one of these Nokia phones. You no, could charge it when you left I had and come home two weeks later and it was still working. Now we're all traveling around with this power plant and plugs and everything and needs to recharge our phone every day. Even half a day, uh, it's gone. Uh, it's, it's very tedious. But it, it, it became a different product. So Nokia could have seen it and gone down that route. They didn't, and they did. Didn't they see it? They just didn't do it well enough? I mean, Nokia's CEO may have been on Harvard's list. I don't know, the ranking there. Probably, uh, probably earlier on, yeah. They were Finland's and Scandinavian's most valuable company at the point in time. But so there's always a risk. 
Yes? You, you, you come across, you sell yourself as rather self-assured. Do you have a fear that something like that could happen in, in your business? I know you're in a totally different field. Yeah, so th there, are, there are a couple of things. As I said, 95% of people with diabetes get th diabetes because they change their lifestyle. They move from rural areas into cities, therefore it jives very well with the theme of urbanization. And when you move into cities, you change your, your work habits, you change your eating habits, and people get uh, fat, and they don't do exercise, and then they get type 2 diabetes. And it happens in every country in the world. We can have, there's a straight correlation between GDP and prevalence of diabetes. Every country in the world needs to do this, make the same mistakes. It's all about education. I mean, where I come from in Copenhagen, uh, if you take uh, the northern part of Copenhagen and compare that to Husum, uh, which is in the western part of Copenhagen, there's a five, seven years life expectancy difference between Husum and Holte, where I live. That's not because it's dangerous to live in Husum. It's because people that are living in Husum are making, in general, on average, bad health choices. So, it will happen eventually all over the world. And therefore, what can make us obsolete is if all of a sudden everybody got up in the morning and ran 5K, and when they came home in the evening, they also ran 5K, and we all only ate appropriately. That's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. Until we become smart enough and find out, ah, uh, this lifestyle that we have is not really conducive to our health. Maybe we should get back and invest in education of our kids, have more physical uh, activity in school, uh, create safe roads so that we don't have to drive them to school, but they can r ride the bicycle. And back to the old virtues. But we o every society makes the mistake. But, uh, and that's also not in your interest as a company. But that's what we are advocating. I know, but it's not in your interest, is it? Well, you always, but that's about being honest. You have, if we want to be seen as a partner with ministries of health, with patient organizations, with medical professions, then we have to give the best possible advice. And if, if the best possible advice is prevention, then we should start there. We're having a program right now, there will be a big conference in Copenhagen next week, Cities Changing Diabetes, where we have recruited five cities, Mexico City, Houston, Copenhagen, Shanghai, and Tianjin with a view to have these five cities uh, as pilots on trying to understand what does urbanization do to health and tell each other and exchange ideas of how can we develop our cities but at the same time doing it in a, in a way which is conducive to our health. Copenhagen is quite far advanced in that regard with the hope that this will proliferate throughout the world. What are we going to get out of that? Well, a reputation as being a trustworthy partner. So corporate social responsibility is not just something, f you know, 4th of July or in this country, 5th of June speeches. You have to live it every day. day. Every day. Now, th th there's a question there. Would the ultimate goal be to completely eliminate diabetes and thereby also the foundation of the company? Th that sort of goes into this. And the answer is yes. If it can be done, it will be done. With 600 million people projected to be having diabetes, this is the biggest public health problem we've ever had. If it can be eradicated, it will be. Then it's better that we help doing it than our competitors or somebody else. As I say to my employees, I say, you know, then we can, if need be, then we can close the shop and you can get a job anywhere because you've done one of the greatest things for humankind and you can feel proud uh, of having been part of it. Because if it can be done, it will be done. You mean this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump to something completely different, as we say in my business. I don't really know why this question is being asked, but I'm still curious of the answer. What are your morning routines? <laughs> <laughs> I think they are quite ordinary. Uh, this morning, I got up at 5 something like this because I had a drive over here and it was kind of a long drive <laughs> I have to say. Uh, I have the pleasure of being able to on one hand decide what I want to do with my time but then on the other hand I have a lot of stakeholders that are 
trying to engage with me. And, and I have an obligation as also representing our company, for instance, here, and not just always in Copenhagen. Uh, and I'd love to do that. So um, my job is varied. Every day is different. But there's always a quarterly result. There's always uh, investor roadshows. There's, there's sort of a skeleton to uh, the routines. And also because managing such a large company, you have to have a lot of processes. I mean Meaning? The, 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 I mean, we have... I'm participating in uh, the committee that decides on development of new drugs, the big cost items of spending in clinical research. So I participate in that to make sure that we have the, the necessary resources. I'm, I'm not, don't give medical advice, but I just give my gut feeling for, mm. I think this is good and this is not so good. So there are lots of things and this has to progress. So th you're, you're, at a, you're at a different stage in your life than most of the people here. W what's your ambition now? I mean, they, they want to get out, they want to work there, they maybe even want to get to that job interview. Yeah. What, what's your ambition now? Well, I, um, I want to make sure that I hand over the company in a, in a responsible way, hopefully to a leadership uh, and with a strategy and financial health that uh, ensures that uh, these 40,000 people and their families and the 24 million people that we service every day, that, th that they, can, they can rely on us being there uh, long term. But then, of course, there's also a point in time where you have to say, all right, maybe it's time for somebody else to get a shot at it. Uh, and, and so when that time is ready, then uh, I will have no problem uh, leaving my job. I've really? I've had a nice run. Really? I'm <laughs> you know it's, easy, it's easy to say. Yeah, but, but it, I'd have to say, it, it, may, lo it may look easy, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> it is really, really, really a lot of hours. And so people that, that want my job, I, 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 I interview and have sessions with many uh, new employees. I tell them, you just got to realize, if you want my job, you are not likely to be national champion in triathlon, be the cooking champion, picking up the kids from the kindergarten, be a wonderful husband or spouse or whatever. You can't be everything with a job like this. So you have to decide for yourself how important is the job because it is a, it's a quite demanding job. And what drove you to then choose that that was it? That I mean, did you make it as, as a decision or did it just sort of come along, there was an opportunity? It's interesting. This is a question I always get from our young employees also. And, and, and usually, I, s the usu I, I answer the usual uh, bullshit, you know. I, I'm, very com I'm very competitive <laughs> and uh, we I want to win and things like this. This is, of course, true. But what I have to ask myself is, why do I want to win? And then we get down to a layer which is much, 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 much more, more private in the sense that maybe I have a, a balance between self-confidence and self-worth, which is tilted in the direction that I, that I need to win to get recognition, to hopefully improve my, my feeling of self-worth. Do you say that to them then? Yeah. What do they say? Well do they understand? Do they... Yeah, because I... Th when I... W we, we try to have some open sessions like that uh, occasionally when, when people are w willing to engage and, and where we try to draw... So then we draw up uh, our lifeline where so how's the professional life going up and down and you know, like this, right? And then I says, so what about your private life? Try to do the same curve on your private life. Are there any correlation? And then we start to discuss. And so, so what I find is that the people are, uh, their ambitions are formed early in life. And their personal characteristics are formed very early in life. And they better recognize it so they can understand why they're doing things uh, they're doing. So you're saying if you go into that job interview that 
you guys were asking about, you got to know yourself before exactly. you go into who you are. Uh, and and uh, our recommendation is also try to be yourself more, but with skills. <laughs> Meaning somebody, somebody, some people can be too much. I mean, they have to tone it down a little, right? Others, they need to, because if, if you try to be somebody, if I was trying to be Mass, everybody knows Mass Olsen in Denmark. He's a, a renaissance person, a very cultural, gifted individual that uh, was very visionary, uh, building the philosophy of the company. And so when I got the job, I asked myself, so, oh, God, man, what am I going to do? Do I have to start to go to the opera and uh, go to art exhibitions and become intellectual? And, <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized I was probably going to fail on that front. And so I said, let's try being myself and see if it works, because it's worked so far. Uh, and if it doesn't, for some reason, then at least you have self-respect. Now, I have a feeling that people don't know the auditorium there in the what. We can take one question here. What, 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 what role do you believe the IT will play in strengthening your leadership in diabetes? That's a very great question. This is something we don't know. Uh, we are working under a project at the moment, and, and there may be others here that can help us, uh, called Digital Health. Because it is clear that there are companies that are trying to get into to our business uh, that are not healthcare companies, but that are trying to be the interface between our customers, people with diabetes, and trying to improve their care by collecting data on their health on an ongoing basis. And, and this is a challenge. Let me, let me give you an analogy analogy, car companies, the German car companies, they have a lot of problems these days. Uh, but they also identified another problem, which was that they were worried that Google, uh, because Google had this wonderful Google map, that, that Google would eventually be able to develop uh, automated cars and manage the interface between the, the car owner, where the car was, where he was driving, when he needed service, and uh, take complete control of the relationship between the individual and the issue of transportation. So what they did, the German car in fact, they went out and bought the only alternative map uh, to not be in a situation where they were all being subordinated uh, to Google. Now we're trying to figure out the same for us. If somebody comes in and manages all the healthcare information that we as individuals eventually in the future with, with micronized sensors and Bluetooth and small computers that don't need power supply and all these fantastic gadgets uh, eventually will do to us in the future. And I don't know. I can't answer it. I think it will revolutionize our business much more so than we, th uh, than we think today. And you have to be there, right? You have to... Well, we, we have to, to create partnerships. I think we, we are not good at this. So this is one area where uh, we are cur currently working on two uh, negotiations with two companies in partnerships uh, on something which we are not good at, but which may link into this. And hopefully uh, we can announce it within uh, the remaining part of the year. So here's an area while we get this one microphone down to somebody with a question. Huh? I actually do get some questions in here, I think. I just need to put my glasses on to be able to read it. But uh, Are you a vein? You don't want to put the yeah, glasses on? Yeah, yeah, I'm a vein, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've identified that one a few years ago. Uh, but actually, y this is an area where you say we're not good at. Yeah. Th this, is, this is an area where you have to go outside your main philosophy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tricky. Well, we, we license in technologies. I mean, sure. uh, many, we have collaboration with many academic institutions, many biotech companies, uh, where they have developed technologies that, that uh, we need. For instance, we are in the process of trying to see if we can develop our medication, which up until now have been injected, develop them as a tablet. That would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? I mean, if mm -hmm. we could avoid having to inject themselves, people can take a tablet. But to be able to do that, we need some formulation technology which we don't have in the company because we don't make tablets. So we went out and bought that and brought it into the house. And so it's in a way it's similar. And then you want to you want to go to the point where that's where you're good at as well. Or, or yeah, at least, uh, well, I think initially the ambition is to try to understand what goes on in the interface between med medicine and IT. And then once we understand where we think it's going, what the business model is, then maybe we have to build those competencies ourselves. Great, if this doesn't really work the way it should. Any anybody with a question, then we'll get the microphone down. 
to you? No? It's all. I see no arms here, but I do see... Actually, an important question here, because you must be thinking about this. What's the biggest difference between you, the leader, and the rest of the competitors on the market, in your field, I guess? Focus. They don't focus? Focus. 80% of our business is diabetes. The others are more broad-based uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have market leadership position. There is no way we cannot succeed. <laughs> then, but then, because, I mean, we have to succeed. Otherwise, the company is dying. So I think we will go through an extra effort to succeed because we know it's survival for us. Because you're specialized in We specialized in diabetes. And then a few other areas, but they are actually growing much less than diabetes. So eventually, over time, it'll be all diabetes almost. But if the other ones are bigger and they wanted They're to They're not get bigger you than us. We are the bigger. In other fields altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but they're making rational decisions. They, they also have to make investment decisions. So their cash flow, their earnings have to be applied to the different therapeutic areas. And they do that based on economic models of return. And uh, so if they threw everything into diabetes, then they would lose the shirt in their other fields. Uh, so which is just a different strategy. You're not scared. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> if, if this, our business case, if a business school should invent a business case better than this, I wish them good luck. This is the best business case you can, you can imagine. This is health. This is the consumer's requirement of the, of, of the product. It doesn't get any better than that. The, the number of patients are increasing. Their level of outcomes of their treatment is poor. You have global leadership, you have global footprint. It doesn't get better than this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's a challenge for you. Make <laughs> a better business case. A couple of last questions. Somebody has asked, who's your mentor? Who do you look up to? I don't look up to anybody. <laughs> because of course, I took inspiration from my, my predecessor. I worked for him for many years. Uh, but as I say, he worked uh, for the company at a different point in time than the time where I'm leading it. He was a very different person. So I, what I picked up was, uh, you know, on this I kind of came from the business side. So I, I started as a controller and hardcore uh, finance. Uh, and planning. But what I saw with him, I saw the powerfulness of, of capturing people's hearts and, and have them bring that motivation into their job. He was extraordinarily good at this. Uh, and, and, and so that's perhaps one of the things that I've, I've learned from. But I think one can get confused if you have mentors uh, because then you confuse their business with your own and so I, and I don't have time either. It's very much in fashion. Huh? It's very much in fashion. Find a mentor. Yeah. You, you hear it everywhere. Yeah. You don't believe in it. <laughs> Maybe I should have a mentor that is uh, retired to find out what, how I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, a last thing. If, if, is there a thought you want people to have in their head when, when they leave this session here? Something they should be thinking about. Yeah, I think, and this was something I was inspired to think about when I was going to do the commencement speech at, at the, uh, the bachelor's program in Copenhagen Business School. I, I had to find out how, to, how does one do that. <laughs> so I looked into uh, others that had done this before, and I came across a person that, uh, that had some reflections, which I I've actually taken to my own heart. I think people should understand here that you're damn lucky. You're damn lucky that uh, you are either born in Denmark, there is such a country as Denmark, and that you have been able to enter uh, this school, this university, where you meet a whole lot of other very lucky people. 
There are alternatives to living in Denmark and going to Aarhus University, meeting other bright people. And you will eventually, when you're finished, you will get out and you get a job with even more lucky people. And so I think what we should remember is that we have been blessed with a lot of luck. And then we can manage that opportunity more or less well. But we should remember that there are people that um, have been much less fortunate than we are. Well, as a guy I worked with for a long time, he used to say, you can't go past that. So let's round it off here. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. Thank you.